I'm, I was deputy mayor of New York several years ago, which was at the, more or less at the beginnings of the open data movement, if you will. New York City had a very broad policy that I inherited. And basically, the goal was to see how much data you could get up in as ugly and unreadable fashion as possible, check the box and move on to the next problem, right? So, so this is probably not how you all think of your uh, use of open data. So I want to talk a little bit about some stories we put together, thank you, uh, in a book that uh, Beth mentioned. So uh, let's, um, so you all, I mean, I'm following a, a CTO and, and I'm not one. And so we're not going to, this is not going to be a technology presentation, but I think it's worth noting that, you know, we, we, we know all these tools, but um, when we put these tools together, we're probably at the most important point in time in a century with respect to how to change government, right? If you, if you take performance management and the STAT programs at best, the country's leading expert on the open data work that, that you all represent here today, the efforts in places like Chicago to build the data analytics center, uh, the ability to use citizens as part of the open data and the data analytics center to, to create ideas and innovation. And I want to talk about employee empowerment before we finish because I think it's an, it's an important uh, point as well. And, from, uh, and I'm thinking as we talk about open data that there's not only valuable opportunity with respect to how the data drives collaboration with communities, but how it drives collaboration inside the four walls of government that often are uh, their barriers as well. So um, I, I want to uh, be a little more abstract just for a second. So it, all of this data allows us for really the first time to look at uh, outcomes and outputs of what government is, is attempting to accomplish. And the theory here is that you know, uh, we'll go back to, you know, I, I'm materially older than Beth. So when I was doing performance management, he, and uh, the, the fellow who did it for me, Skip Stitz, in the back of the room, here was our definition of performance, right? Uh, I'll exaggerate a, a little bit, but we, we could measure uh, how quickly and how well we accomplished an activity. We couldn't really measure whether the activity uh, accomplished the output that was in our scorecard, right? But and so today with open data movements and data mining, we can make a little bit of difference. And this is just an, a, a quick example for you to think about. When I was deputy mayor of New York, the woman who sat next to me was one of the country's best uh, public officials, Linda Gibbs. She was in charge of social services. Before she had the job as deputy mayor, she was in charge of homelessness. She went in one day to her, um, her agency and said, how, how do we measure success? And they said, we measure success by the number of homeless bed shelter, sh homeless shelter beds that we produce for those who don't have housing. And she looked at them for a second and said, you know, no, that's, that's the definition of failure. The definition of public value, our de definition of public value is when we prevent homelessness, not when we provide a bed for those who are homeless. Now, if you think about that for a second, it appears to be irrelevant to the topic today, but it isn't, right? Because now if we have open data and we have data analytics and we have predictive data, we can figure out why the person is homeless and solve that problem. And previously, we didn't. So as we think about this movement, I think it's important to keep coming back to the definition. What is the definition of public value and how does data really drive that um, in, in, as well? And as we think about performance measurement and performance management in this context, right, um, uh, this is all inherent in your work, but for those of us who are kind of may, maybe one level away, uh, it's all about uh, visualization, right? This is just an example of one of the better visualized sites, uh, Boston About Results where you can obviously drill through these, uh, these uh, tiles to see, the, see what's going on and how the connection between uh, visualization uh, unlocks discoveries in, in the STAT programs. And, and I really think that we're, we're at a point in time where we haven't fully connected uh, open data, STAT programs, and predictive analytics, where the three to come together to really dramatically transform the way government works. Um, and these are just some examples of of the visualization tools that uh, Cook County and, uh, and Socrata, for example, um, are using. Um, the, the theme here of these last few slides is uh, we've, the, the, the steps that have taken in the last three years to visualize data uh, have made it usable and, and the utilization of the data will drive the performance of public value. So this is just another way to define public value that we think about, right? So, so it isn't, um, uh, how many potholes we fill per se, right? It's not how many traffic signals get fixed, how quickly. 
it's how we manage mobility in a community that makes a difference. So when we think about uh, the data feeds and the open data, we've got uh, sensor data, we've got data from individuals who live in the city, we've got data inside city government. This is just an example of what we did in New York City, which was uh, if we took all the data from GPS readers that were in the taxi cabs, from easy, easy pass readers that were in the cars, uh, mined that data, connected that data to the, the traffic lights and the definition of performance here for the purposes of publication was how, how quickly we moved traffic, right? Not, not how fast we did any one of those activities. Um, second, um, I, I, you probably all have heard this story, um, but I think it's an important one as well, and I'll, I'll do it quickly so I, I don't bore those of you who have read about it, and if I do it so quickly you don't follow it, it's also in the book uh, responsive city written by Steve Goldsmith, which I'd encourage you to buy anyway. So, um, so um, here, uh, deputy mayor of New York City. So we have this situation, right? A, a, a family dies in a fire of a home that had been uh, illegally converted to multiple dwellings, right? So one definition you could think about in terms of open data and and measurement is I I knew the Daily Post and the news were going to call to ask whether we ever had a complaint on those on that house before. So I, you know, I called the buildings department, they said, because they kind of more or less reported to me, and they said, yeah, we've gotten a complaint, but we get 30,000 complaints a year, and we're working through it, and we've already been to that house once. And I called the fire department, I got the same answer, but it was like 50,000 or vice versa. We're still working through it, right? So you can imagine an activity and performance report that says our standard of performance is how quickly we get to the complaints that we receive. Or you can imagine the following, right? So there, in the back of uh, City Hall, there was a, a guy named Mike Flowers who was a data scientist uh, with some mysterious background, I think, in the military or whatever. And he said, just give me 60 days. And 60 days later, he came back and he took um, tax foreclosures, uh, mortgage foreclosures, tax delinquencies, 911 calls, 311 calls, code enforcement information, I looked at the, about eight different data sets, put them together and said, I can improve the predictability of which of those 50,000 complaints is going to lead to a fire by a thousand times, right? And so that then led to an identification of 300 dwellings and a team of individuals, fire and building, who went out there and mitigated the problem, right? So, so now we've got the use of data allowing us to not just measure how quickly we solve a problem after it occurs, but allowing us with the use of data analytics to solve in advance a problem and measure that as, a, uh, as an accomplishment as well. In a period of time, right, where we have too many problems for the resources available in government to be able, right, to redirect resources to outliers rather than treating every widget as manufactured exactly the same is, is a tremendous opportunity that we can see through data. Many of you know that we're doing, that, that many cities are doing it in policing, uh, parole and probation. Philadelphia is the best example of kind of how to reorient the the, um, the, and recalibrate and reassign parole and probation assignments based on a set of predictive requirements that inside the data as well. Now let me just mention a couple other quick things and, and, um, and then uh, slow down and take your questions. Um, one is that, um, so I think what's interesting about um, Socrat and what you're doing is, is the following. And, uh, so I tried to create a data analytics center in New York City, and I'm an uh, advocate of, of data analytics. I think it's a huge transformative opportunity, but also runs the following risk, right? So um, we have uh, public officials who, uh, and employees who are professionally trained, and the definition of professionally trained is you become very good in your technical area, right? And now you add data analytics, and with data analytics and your professional training, you can become really sure you know what's in everybody else's best interest, right? I, I know what that person needs. I know what that neighborhood needs. But there's a lot of information out, right, in the communities themselves. And, and so how do we take and integrate the data? You heard about some of the Chicago story earlier today that's in the community with the data that's in the city enterprise or the state enterprise to produce value. This is an example of, uh, of you know, the... the, the post if you have flu on the site as well. And then many of you have seen that, that we're trying to, Boston has done a nice job early on with uh, taking the uh, uh, Android, iPhone, and the like uh, app reported uh, information, integrating that into the 311 database with the pictures and allowing citizens to actually become 
you know, like human sensors of the, of the problems in their communities. And then socialize that information, right? So, so we, can, um, we can see uh, uh, more easily community engagement defined as social media interaction with the data inside the city or state government and where we're asking questions and then you know, scoring in a collaborative way the answers to those questions. So now the definition of collaboration is quite different. You know, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm from a, an, an age when the, where the definition of, of community input is the following. You know, um, I'm a mayor uh, uh, or my transportation director uh, or school superintendent decides what we're going to do. We then go to a community meeting, which lasts four and a half hours, where people scream at us for four hours. Then we leave and do what we were going to do anyway, right? And that's the definition of community engagement. Well, you know, that, that the people in that meeting are not necessarily representative. The way you listen to that information is not particularly helpful. So now, how do we mine the, the social media? How do we engage the community in a way that interacts with the data we have inside the organization? The Smart Chicago platform uh, that you've heard a little bit about uh, which is uh, funded uh, m uh, with a fair amount of foundation money, which sits between the, the Chicago great data analytics effort and the communities and it helps them produce value from their open data as an example. There's just, uh, the, 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 this section of my uh, uh, quick presentation is, is really to suggest that there's a lot of information in the public that can be combined with uh, open data that we have in the, pub, in, the, in the government enterprise to produce value. And this is where Mayor Gray uh, began grading uh, his, uh, his departments based on uh, tweets and uh, other social media responses from citizens, residents who used, in this case, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, tweet back what you think. The reason I think this is particularly interesting is he put this in his performance, his stat program. He measured every month his agencies on what colors these were, and these grades went from D's to C's to B's, right? It just shows if we take the data, we measure the data, we uh, visualize the data, we hold people accountable, that, that things change, and this is a great example of that as well. Um, so uh, I, the next big evolution that's going to connect to the work you're doing, right, is the next uh, uh, transformation in 311 call centers, right? Um, uh, call centers, uh, you know, we thought of uh, call centers as really effective when they just took a lot of complaints. Now the next generation of call centers are looking at 311 as a platform for community engagement, not as a place just to complain. We had, uh, New York City call center, we got 20 million calls a year. Uh, people could see, you know, they could visualize the data and see the complaints, but they really couldn't figure out much about it because it was pretty ugly. This is just an example of how how we visualized uh, 311 complaints. Every one of those uh, yellow circles represents a complaint. The larger the yellow circle, the, the, the greater the number of complaints that are there. We, we went out and uh, hired a, uh, a young college student, had her train the community board presidents in most of the 60 community uh, boards in New York City about how to get inside the data, uh, how to educate their community about what they could see. You know, uh, when did the complaint come in? How quickly did it take to resolve? What were the other issues in the neighborhood? You know, in the agencies, and I think many of you run into this in your work, the agencies go, look, I don't want to hear any more about open data. It just means more opportunities for people to complain to us, right? And so, and when we did this in New York City, Transportation, Public Works, Parks has said, you know, all you're going to do is set yourself up for trouble because you're going to give people more information about what we have done and what we have not done. In fact, the opposite was true, right? People know how to complain anyway. What this allowed them to do is come up with solutions. And just for an example, in one community I visited, uh, you know, the community board leader said, look, when I saw this, I finally realized you got a lot of pedestrian uh, hits or near misses on, on that corner. And you know the reason you do is because you have a senior citizen's home on one side of the street and you've got a pharmacy on the other side of the street and your transportation as your department insists that the walk wait signs be timed a certain particular way because that's how professionals say traffic flows and it doesn't work at our intersection so why don't you change it right so, so the, the point here is that this the visualization and interaction between community data and the big data allows us very dramatically to come up with insights particularly when we take the time to educate our communities on how they can use our data um, uh, the other problem, just uh, in, in closing, is kind of us, those of us, and I've been in uh, local or state government for 25 years or so, 
And so we make it impossible for our employees to really uh, work effectively. Uh, they, they, they work in hierarchies, command and control systems. Uh, they work in vertical agencies. You know, people, people do not live in the Transportation Department or the Parks Department or the Public Works Department. They live in a neighborhood. And each one of those departments touches their neighborhood in a different way. So, so this data, these lights in these windows, uh, the open data movement to me is most powerful because it lets people see across the agencies. It lets them see up and down in ways that they could never do before. And then if we give employees authority and power and discretion, they can solve problems they haven't seen. And, and whether they're uh, online idea hubs or, or, or you know, in Boston, the city workers soon will be able to actually send a picture back to the resident who complained about the pothole saying, I'm Joe and I fixed your pothole and I'm proud I did it, right? We need to create a kind of a retail relationship between the public worker and, and the person in the city. These, these changes, these, w w these relationships will, will increase performance fairly dramatically. Um, and then uh, if you put all this together, um, this, trying to, there's a interesting effort in Indiana in particular to uh, put everything together to drive data to the handheld tools that the Child Protective Service worker takes into the home so that she sees not only all the information that used to be paper-based, but she receives decision support tools that look across uh, what do the Guardian have, previous cases, school, police, medical, counselor, not just put that information into a tablet, but provide decision support tools as well. And then uh, this is San Francisco's integration of its Yelp scores on restaurants with its, uh, with its uh, health inspections so that now the data is really coming together in an interesting way because we have the public data and the community data and then we're putting that out in a way that a resident or a consumer can use as they make decisions. And then finally, just as you all know, it takes leadership, right? It takes somebody at the top who wants to make a difference, who says that open data is, is not a check mark business, it's a performance business and it's a trust business. The more that citizens see transparency, the more they see their engagement makes a difference, the more they'll trust the way government operates. And uh, that requires some leadership at the top through the uh, chief data officer or CRO, CIO or uh, chief innovation officers, officer as the case may be. Plenty of obstacles that you all know about, but uh, answers to those obstacles, privacy issues and the like are quite important uh, and need to be explicitly addressed put it together and we can create um, uh, a really a new way of, of looking at things. I, I just, um, I, I really have, I've been at this for a while and uh, we have such a dramatic opportunity because the challenges have never been greater, right? The amount of problems we have and the money we have to solve them don't fit. And the technology tools are greater than ever before. Just in the last two or three years alone, uh, visualization tools, open data tools, data mining tools, cloud-based tools, the ubiquity of m mobile devices, all is greater. The only thing that's really holding us back is the structure of government itself. We need to give our employees more discretion. We need to listen to our communities better. When we do that, we can drive public value in a really brand new and very exciting way that we haven't been able to do in quite some time. Thank you very much. Thank you, as always. Steven has been a mentor to me from my days in Maryland, um, also a, a mentor for Martin O'Malley. It's so great to have you here. Um, I have a couple questions, and then we're going to open it up for questions um, to the larger group. You know, the m one question, when, when I hear predictive analytics, I always hear the story of Mike Flowers in New York City um, predicting the next uh, residential ha housing fire. And, you know, is, is Mike Flowers the unicorn? Or is this really something that's in our grasp? And if you think it is in our grasp, which I hope you do, um, what, like, what are the barriers that you see and are yeah. they overcomeable and where do you see people overcoming them? How many questions was that? Come on, Steve. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, well, Mike Flowers was at least the first unicorn. Um, and uh, he was in an interesting situation because he had a lot of skills and a portfolio that allowed him to do whatever he wants. Um, so let me answer your question carefully. Um, Mike, I think, is both an example of something great and something that's a little problematic. And, and, the, and by the latter, I mean there was no institutional effort at that time in 
predictive analytics in only a very early period of time in using open data. So uh, he had a portfolio that allowed him to just do stuff, which is kind of the way uh, Mike Bloomberg worked and the way Mike worked. Um, as contrasted to Brenna Berman in Chicago, where the mayor has set up a data analytics center for the purposes of, of making the Mike Flowers type work be more viral. So, um, so I, 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 don't, I think the, the, the New York model was good at its time and I think it's limited because what it does, it, 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 it limits the number of use cases that can be unlocked. So when I was in New York City, I, uh, uh, one of the uh, bright young women in the operations group that, that, that worked with me, I asked her to go to every agency and ask them if you could get three or four questions answered that would most change the way you work, what would those questions be? And after a little bit of uh, prodding, she came back with 100 questions, right? And, and that is really how the rat story happened. Brenna decided that if the CIO, C, CDO, or whatever the case may be, decides on what should be looked at predictively, it has a very limited uh, leveraging. If you go to the agency and say, okay, what are the problems you're thinking about? And then you say, well, here are some data we can use to solve those problems. Then you create um, this uh, kind of viral effort in government. So I, I think Mike was a unicorn. I think the platforms now are better. And the way I had envisioned it, and I think you know, one uh, maybe useful way to uh, set it up is that you have, because uh, most of these, most cities and states can't afford a lot of this uh, talent. So that if in the CDO, CIO's office is the most elite talent, but in every one of the agencies that, you know, has significant operating uh, or policy effect, there is somebody who cares about this issue, right? So they, they may be a little less technical, but they're really inquiring people. Then, and, and they meet every month to talk about who's doing what, what's happening then it will produce. And then finally, um, Beth, I, and you may want to comment this, but I, to me it seems like to the extent that marries up with the work that you did so well in Maryland or Baltimore, right? So you have the STAT program, and the STAT program m married up with open data and predictive analytics. And I'm not sure we have to worry too much about exactly who's in charge of which for purposes of discussion. I think that will produce the, the volume of activity we need. But I do think that the, the point that government gets in its own way here is one that I don't think is lost on anybody. I mean, even in those days, I, we, we had conversations in Maryland, and I think crime was one that we were focused on. We had sort of a predictive tool. We were trying to identify uh, before they were victims of violent crime, so trying to figure out using an instrument um, whether or not someone was going to be sh shot or would be the victim of a murder in our in our uh, mo mostly in Baltimore City and the Washington D.C. suburbs. But we were using a tool. We were using a validated tool through a university, um, but it came with a lot of challenges. Our local legislature didn't want us to use certain of the screening criteria because they it would it would be biased, which it would have been biased. Um, there are a lot of things in privacy laws that would have prohibited us to do certain things in the screenings, particularly as it relates to warning or risk factors for younger offenders. Um, and so there are a lot of things that we that that we but but it's not just about the privacy. It's it is about you know this kind of minority report sort of thing and the, you know striking the right balance between those you know those the reason why we have some of those laws, some of those laws that have been on the books way before the internet was invented, way before. Um, you know, computers played a central role in the way that government operated, but we're still sometimes operating under some of those laws and regs. And so how do we get government to get out of the way of itself without sacrificing on the privacy side, without sacrificing on this idea that we do as individuals have rights as well? Is that a statement or a question? That's a little bit of both, I think. Um, yeah. So, well, one answer to your question is, hire a good lawyer because there's lots of lawyers that'll tell you what you can't do. I mean, it's just, they're just everywhere. Um, I'm a lawyer, but it was just, the, the fights in Indianapolis and New York City on what's legal and what's not were, were quite problematic. But um, another way to think about it, and I'm serious about that, that, that ought to be somebody uh, appointed with responsibility that, that reports to the, whoever's leading the effort, who is a problem solving lawyer with the ear of the governor or, or the mayor. Uh, that's that you know that effort has made a difference in, in Indiana. Um, I think the other thing, and there was a privacy question at the last session, is um, that there, there are not very many of us. And I suspect not too many in the room even 
who have very explicit data privacy protocols for their government, right? Is there a forensic audit? Who has access to what sort of information? Um, how long is it archived? When is it anonymized, right? And then, and then, and that's transparent, and everybody knows it. And we really need to get to that point because because it, it's it's naive to assume. I mean, for there's two sides of the coin, obviously, right? The, the power of data is power to help. The power of data is a power to label when you maybe shouldn't be doing it. So I just think we need to be very explicit about what we're doing. But much of the work we can accomplish in terms of performance can be from anonymized data, though, really. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most illustrative stories that I can tell is we were, and Josh Exler, I think, actually helped work on this in Maryland. Um, we had asked the question of two agencies that had historically not worked well together. We wanted to know from our parole and probation agency the addresses of where all of our registered sex offenders, which was an open public data set was, um, where they lived, and also our most dangerous offenders, which was also relatively easy to get access to. But we wanted to create a map that had all of those addresses overlaid with where all of our registered foster homes were in the state. And for me, it was a question that we should have been asking every single day when we were placing children in foster care. Um, and for the agencies that were involved, it was a very difficult question for them to answer because they historically had been completely blocked from sharing information. And so in order for us to actually do that data match, we had to actually go to the legislature and change the law. And the output of that law change, and the day it was executed, we did the match of the data. And sure enough, in the magnitudes of not just a handful, but like of hundreds, there was overlap in addresses. And so all of a sudden, we had a massive problem, which is we've got kids that are in our care or potentially are going to be placed in houses that we've ordained or licensed that could possibly be spending, you know, supposedly some of the most vulnerable times in their lives with some of our most dangerous offenders. So we already knew that that was a problem. And so then we had to, you know, be very reactive. And if we could have shared that information and when we started peeling back the onion on the law around the issues, it really was meant written at a time that was no longer relevant to the conversations that we were having. And we realized that this was just the tip of an iceberg. And I think that one of the things that I charge everyone to do when they go back to their jurisdictions is take a look at, you know, I was the person that constantly got said no to, um, you know, in these meetings. And I had a lawyer sitting next, I'm a lawyer too, believe it or not, self-hating and everything. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, sitting next to me at all times was another lawyer. And every time that th there was a legal barrier thrown up in those stat meetings, the first thing I would do is say, Okay, let's table that. Cassie, can you go and research this and make sure that this is actually a true barrier? And I would say nine times out of right, ten, right. there are ways around it, Absolutely. but the AG's office aren't going to be the ones who are going to go and really help us. You know, you really do have to have that sort of advocate lawyer that understands your program, that understands what you're trying to accomplish, and is there to help you get to yes instead of there to make sure that your agencies are protected by saying no. And I think that that, I can't even tell you how important it was to saving lives and, and to really delivering amazing services in the state. Um, are there other questions? Are there questions for, from the crowd before I continue? Because I've got questions for Steve, but I'd love to grab some other people and get them involved in the conversation if there's other people who want to be involved. No? This is really the end of the day, Steve. We've yeah. really yeah. hit our stride here. OK, so I do have a couple other questions. Um, do they get to drink when we're done? Yeah, that's okay. the other thing. We're like between now and drinking, so sorry about all that. Um, <laughs> so we, you talked a lot about predictive, but I really want to go back into, we had a, we had a um, unfortunately, you weren't able to join us yesterday. We had a really great talk about sort of where open data should sit and should it just be about transparency or should the first sort of step in what we're doing is really a connection between systems and, and, and how hard of work that is but what that would look like. And I'd love to hear from you a little bit about sort of where you see open data, the value internal t versus that sort of what the really kind of common understanding of what open data is, which is a really more outwardly facing. All right. Well, um uh, trying to figure out how many stories to tell. So, um, in the early days of the CDOs, right? Um, New York was early, um, and in uh, even the use of, of social media, uh, there was a debate 
among cities about does this where where does the CDO where is that where is the CDO located, which is kind of another way of ask, asking your question. And um, many cities today in the U.S. look at social media. It's a little different than open data, but the, my, my point will be the same. As a way to tell the communities how cool they are, right? So it's a, it's a new media to tell people really what you're doing right. It's not a method of learning, right? And, and there's a huge amount of information that's repository in, in workforces and in, in work crews and neighborhoods about how to do things. So um, I, 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 to, one way to answer your question is wherever the strongest leader is, which is not very helpful. Another an way to answer your question is I, th I think the power of the movement it will really is most effective when it's connected to performance, whoever is in charge of the performance or innovation uh, uh, part of government, right? So because you can, you have outward facing information and, you, and I mean, um, uh, three years ago, uh, I, I bet 90% of the agency C CIOs in the country if you asked them about open data, would say, I'm all for open data, but my data is legacy data, and it really, I can't, it just won't talk to anybody, right? Uh, or I want to do predictive analytics. Well, you can do predictive analytics, but you can't, my data sets, I, it's private, and it's old, and clunky, and I can't do it, right? So somebody has to be able to, to say, no, really, we don't, we don't want to integrate your data. We want to read your data. We want to extract your data. We want to do whatever. So, so I, I very forcefully believe that, that this effort is, a, is not a technical effort, it's a movement to change government. It needs to be connected at whoever has the ultimate performance responsibility, uh, I mean, other than the elected official, or maybe the elected official in that enterprise. Yeah, this morning we heard from the mayor of Chattanooga and it sounds like it really is his undertaking, right? But You know, when I saw, when I saw you know, as you mentioned, I've known Mayor Governor O'Malley for a long time and, and, and I'm a fan and, and was of city staff, but I saw him three or four years ago personally conduct an infant mortality stat program, right? Where it was well rehearsed in terms of the, the visuals are there, the stat program, the, the staffer had done his work, but the governor was personally involved in, how about this, what about this, you know? And, and I think there's no substitute for that, really. I'm, I, I would agree with that. Um, as much as sometimes like his, uh, <laughs> he went a little too deep and in the weeds in certain things. But I mean, I do think that it is important. I think leadership is critically important. But I, I think the point about transformation is also important. It's been sort of a theme the last couple of days, which is that this is more than just this is this is more than just transparency. This is more about more than just commu communicating externally. But this is about transforming government, the way that government procures technology, the way that government thinks about their problems, the way that government solves their problems. And in, until we start to see this movement sort of aligned with government transformation, and I think we are seeing it, I'm not saying until, I think we are seeing it. Um, I think that that's where we're, that's when we're, when Mike becomes less of a unicorn and more of sort of a thoroughbred. Um, and, you know, and I think that we've got some of those thoroughbreds here and we're sort of seeding and with, you know, a sort of a combination or in partnership with a lot of the work that we're doing and a lot of the work that government is doing, we'll hopefully, um, you know, we'll have sort of the preakness the next time we're together <laughs> when we're... Uh, now you're from Baltimore, yeah, aren't you? Yes. Of course, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one, one way to, to, to do this, it's simple, it seems to me, and, and I know you and I have been talking about this, but to the extent... So if you think about uh, Socrates' tools and, and what should be visualized, um, you know, I'm basically, you know, spent two and a half decades trying to figure out how to pick up trash or fill potholes on a very boring kind of life, and, and, uh, but it interests me. And so I, I would like to visualize um, performance by uh, district or by peer group, right? So that, you can, so that the, you can see it by neighborhood. We already, you already can do that. But how about uh, by which district in Baltimore's transportation department uh, accomplishes goals compared to other districts or which supervisors? You don't have to put names in order to embarrass people, right? But so however you decide you want to create the visualization comparisons and mentor and, and, and peer groups, will drive performance. It will drive performance. The same reason that Mayor Gray got those things to go from D's to C's to B's, because once a month everybody gets to see their color code and sees who's high and who's low. I mean, when you lifted that thing up that Mayor Gray had, it had like a stock, a stock rating of all of the employees. So like the 
agency head had a stock rating based on their performance. And so when he had a cabinet meeting, he would know basically based on the performance indicators where what, how, what the value of the stock yeah. was for that particular leader. That's some crazy stuff, but I loved it. I loved Mayor Gray. Um, okay, well, that's gonna wrap us up. Steve, thank you so much for being with us and joining us and uh, closing us out. Thank you. Thanks.